Ah. Ukraine, a deadly waiting game. Russians digging in, getting ready for an onslaught. Ukrainians training up on the latest 21st century Western tech, holding the line on a battlefield that better resembles World War I. The long-awaited counteroffensive could turn the tide of the war, but its success rests on the courage and ingenuity of Ukraine's citizen soldiers. These are their stories. Pilots who hug the land and pray for F-16s. A sister who lost a brother and followed his footsteps into war. And an infantryman chronicling life on the zero line, knowing his own life could be cut short in an instant. <laughs> this is Ukraine in the spring of 2023. No surrender. Now, a Scripps News special. No Surrender, reporting from Kyiv, Ukraine, Jason Bellini. Good evening from Kyiv, where Western technology is already showing some dramatic results. Just days ago here, a U.S.-provided Patriot air defense system shot down one of Putin's most fearsome weapons, an advanced hypersonic missile. We've been covering this war from the early days of Russia's invasion. We witnessed Ukraine holding back Russia from the capital. And that surprising counteroffensive, taking back Kharkiv and driving Russia out of Kherson. But Russia still controls an estimated 40,000 square miles of this country. And the pressure is mounting on President Vladimir Zelensky to deliver battlefield results to justify the billions of dollars the West has spent to support Ukraine's independence. While the world waits, the citizen soldiers of Ukraine have no choice but to hold fast. Tonight, a rare look at what life is like where Ukrainian and Russian troops are killing each other daily in a brutal war of attrition. Meet Roman. We're so close to the enemies. Sergeant Roman Trokmitz brings you with him. <laughs> close. Close to the shelling. Close to the bloodiest battlefield of the war. And even closer to what's going on in his mind. I'm sure that life is great present. Roman, who's 30 years old, is part of an elite fighting group battling in Bakhmut. With a GoPro on his helmet and cell phone camera, his video diary captures powerful, ah! shockingly intimate moments, like this recent one when he expertly, calmly applied a tourniquet to save a fellow soldier's life. I don't know which video can be last. I don't want to scare you, but so many dies here. I share with you what I'm thinking. Roman shares not just what, but also how he thinks. His cognitive process, what he calls his life system. I hug this life system and realize how you're not afraid to die. Let me just repeat back to what you said. I've hacked this life system so that I'm not afraid to die. Yes, yes. Explain that to me. Okay, almost all people like don't want to die or are afraid to die, right? Right. I try to find a way how not to be afraid. We met up with Roman in Kramatorsk, a city in eastern Ukraine, 35 miles from the front lines. It's a staging ground for medics and soldiers, a place to regroup and rest up for the next battle. When did you get back? Just three or four hours ago. For how many days were you there? It was three days. Three days? Yeah. And how much sleep did you get in three days? Maybe two to three hours per day. He gets a few days to sleep yeah. and upload new posts, a ritual he began around a year ago. Babe, my sniper rifle. What inspired you to do that? Actually, at the beginning, I don't want to do it. I think it was some kind of show off that I'm on war, look at me. I'm such a badass. Roman says his sister convinced him of the value of sharing with the world the war through his eyes. I see through my scope, sniper scope, or sometimes through a machine gun. You've had bullets come close to you. Yeah. Yes. How close? The closest one was this huge machine gun tried to kill me from 500 meters. That's a little more than a football field. A bullet hit the water pack on his back. And it's bullet from big caliber. Yeah, you're not going to survive that. Yes, yes. If it will be in my body, it will be over. Yeah. And how did you feel after that? <laughs> Damn. Okay. <laughs> what will be next? Fights continue everywhere. But still, my emotions is calm. 
I am 100% concentrated. Have you always been such a calm person? No, I'm a very emotional person, actually. In the battle, when emotion overcome your logic, uh, you can easily die and die more quickly than if you control your emotion. Sounds of war. Many people uh, look at me at the battle. If they see panic on my face, it will spread so fast. This is about mind discipline. At war, we met death. It's like our really good friend. She hanging out with us and some of us say, OK, it's your time. Come. Most of the time, 99% of the time, I'm not afraid to die. What about that 1%? I'm a human being. <laughs> Even here, there are beautiful moments, Roman says. It almost seems like sometimes you're enjoying what you're doing. Definitely, you're correct. I always try to find something good in any life situation. So appreciate to eat this delicious energy bar. I realized that life is amazing, guys. <laughs> the war is some kind of drug. You can't find such emotion in normal life. Okay, people try to jump from cliff or uh, snowboarding or something else, but this is more extreme. If you survive, first of all, you just say, what the hell? How, how can it be possible? Have you thought about what your chances are of coming out alive? Yeah, sometimes we have a mission when we can lose maybe, okay, 10%, for example, from our guys. They tell you that there's a 10% chance? We smart guys, we realize. And in some unit, they say directly. A little over a week after we met Roman, Hello. the odds almost caught up with him. He posted this from his hospital bed as he recovered from a concussion. I have no wife and children, so my video is something that I can left after me. If I die on the battlefield, right now many people watch this video and find something valuable in there. You know? This is your legacy. Yes, yeah, this is my legacy, actually. Together, we will win this fight. Take care and be strong. Next, a phenomenal display of aerial skills, a MiG pilot who flies daringly low, and a helicopter pilot who has flown some of the most dangerous missions of the war. Back here in Kyiv with video like a scene from Top Gun, a Ukrainian pilot flying below enemy radar. Tonight, we have rare footage from inside the cockpit. This is the cockpit view as Ukrainian fighter pilot Vadim Voroshilov <laughs> fires missiles from his MiG fighter jet. Aviators like him, he's 29, take extraordinary risks battling the Russians in jets older than himself. How many combat missions have you been on since the start of the invasion? I have 77 combat missions. 77 combat missions? Yes. Yeah. One of those missions made him a Ukrainian hero. Voroshilov, who goes by the call sign Karia, in October took to the skies after radar detected near the central city of Venezia incoming Shahed suicide drones like this one. Karia's orders, search and destroy. You have to see them to destroy them. Our onboard radar system does not allow us to effectively destroy them. We need visual contact with them. But destroy them he did. Five confirmed kills, but at such close range, debris from the fifth drone smashed into both his engines. The plane began to destruct. A fire broke out in the cabin. My ability to control the plane was lost. He aimed his crashing MiG at an open field, away from a village, and then ejected at the last possible moment, recording this video as he parachuted. There was plenty of time because I was flying from a height of about 4,000 feet. I took this photo to check my health because I was bleeding. And secondly, to reassure my comrades who were worried about me, whether I was alive. Ukraine's president named him a hero of Ukraine. Now, as his country battles for the contested legendary city of Bakhmut and prepares for a counteroffensive, pilots like Karia take off on even more high-risk missions. Sorties flown just 65 feet above the surface to duck enemy radar. Karaya shared with Scripps News rarely seen footage that he recorded in his cockpit. We not only risk their air defenses and aircraft firing at us, 
but also the banal risk of running into ground obstacles, such as power transmission lines. But our pilots are all experienced. Ukraine's Air Force rotates pilots out of the sky for, of all things, English lessons. Why right now in the middle of the war are you studying English? We are waiting for Western fighters. We have great hope in our Western partners that we will receive them. After all, this is exactly what will help us speed up the victory. What's more difficult, learning English or learning to fly a fighter jet? <laughs> in my MiG-29, I feel that's my uh, place. Now, when I uh, sit on the English lessons, I don't control all uh, situation. <laughs> For now, all Ukrainian pilots can do is make do. Have you ever been on a mission where one of the planes didn't come back? Tak. Yes, I have been. It was last April. We were in the Izium area, where the enemy was accumulating large strike groups. During one of the missions, our Su-24 bomber aircraft did not return from the mission. He was shot down. The same with Su-25 planes and helicopters. What's it like when you've landed and you're getting out of your MiG-29, knowing that you've lost one of your comrades? No, it's, uh... Of course, we all felt despair when we were on the ground. You see, we have enough defense skills and competencies, but the technical obsolescence of our aircraft does not allow us to fully protect our colleagues from other types of aviation. If you had an F-16, you think you could have protected that bomber? Так. Так. Yes, and very effectively. After surviving, when his plane didn't, back in October, Karia called his wife from the hospital. What did she say? I made a video call. The face was bandaged. I said, everything is fine. Everything is all right. She cried, and that was it. After that, your wife didn't say, no more fighter jets for you? Yeah. She fully and completely supports me. But she told me, please take care of yourself. I said, of course I will protect myself. But she fully understands that there is a war in our country, and we need to work. We've been preparing for this all our lives in order to protect our country, and now is the time to do it. Insights into these daring missions is rare and critical. After all, this is how the war is being fought. This is how Ukraine is holding Russia back. Helicopter pilots also play a key, little-known role in so many landmark moments of this war. And now we're getting a new, stunning view of what these missions are like. Fire your rockets, then escape sideways. Hit-and-run GoPro footage provided to Scripps News by a Ukrainian Army helicopter pilot, Vadim, shows the daring maneuver he perfected over more than a year of combat missions. Are you going into places where they could shoot you down? Constantly. We don't have any tasks in which we don't get into enemy range. If you prepare well, study the landscape, the terrain, you can approach and they won't even see us. Vadim is just 23 years old. He flies the Mi-8, a Russian model designed decades before he was born. The missile system is not state-of-the-art, requiring the pilot to point the helicopter in the target's direction and dial in the coordinates. We receive the coordinates of the target in advance. We see if we can do it or not. If the risk is reasonable, then we take on the task, think over the entire route, ways to get out of there. The role of Ukraine's helicopters in this war is not widely publicized, but they are constantly waging sneak attacks on enemy positions, rescuing battlefield casualties, and rapidly moving troops and commanders. To keep them safe, Ukraine's helicopters are based in secret locations like this one, far from the front line. The commander tells me, that his base surface is an area where he thinks the counteroffensive is likely to kick off. Though far from here, they will reach the battle thanks to auxiliary fuel tanks inside their cargo bays that allow them to fly up to three and a half hours. The closer the pilots get to enemy positions, the lower they must fly. Experienced pilots literally shave the ground, cutting the grass from a couple feet high. Literally like cutting the grass. We fly completely at an extreme low altitude so as not to fall into the zone of enemy air defense systems. Vadim has flown in some of the most legendary battles of the war. He was just out of flight training when Putin invaded. A column of Russian armor headed straight for the capital, Kyiv. 
Um, we were told to patrol the highway and find the column and destroy it. An MI-24 flew as the first helicopter, and we flew in the MI-8 helicopter behind as the second. We decided to attack the tank because it began to target us, and when we flew up to him, we shot him at close range. Time completely slowed down. I imagined the tank firing, a shell flying into the helicopter, how it exploded. Such stupid thoughts came in my head, but we shot him, and we destroyed the column. He would go on to help in the recapture of Snake Island in the Black Sea. It had been captured by the Russians on the first day of the war to use as a staging ground for an assault on the key city of Odessa. The most frightening thing for me was the flight to Snake Island, the flight itself over the water. This rare video shared by Vadim shows the mission. We were flying at a height of around three feet and there was a feeling that water was pouring into the cabin. That was scary. After four months of such daring and constant strikes, the Russians withdrew from Snake Island. And then there were the secret missions, only revealed much later. Our crew voluntarily decided to fly to Azovstal. The Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol. Ukrainian fighters and civilians trapped, bombed and shelled relentlessly, refusing to surrender. <laughs> During the 80-day siege, Vadim and a small band of helicopter pilots would fly rescue missions over more than 60 miles of enemy-held territory. He would record this video from Azovstal while delivering additional soldiers, medicine, and other supplies and evacuating the wounded. Three helicopters on missions similar to his never made it back, shot down by the Russians. Who worries about you the most? Simia. My family, my dad works in our unit, and so every time I flew off, he stood and smoked a cigarette. I think he is the most worried from all, because he himself works in this field, and it was the hardest for him. When I came to fly to Azovstal, my dad met me and said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm flying to Mariupol. He said I was a fool. And what was your answer? None. I just turned around and went away. He didn't stop me because he understood that someone needs to do these missions. Have you lost comrades during this war? Yes. Typically, as seen in this video, a comrade recorded of Vadim during training. Ukraine's helicopters fly in pairs. On one mission, he says, he flew back to base alone. His comrades in the second chopper shot down. In that circumstance, was it really difficult the next time you got into your helicopter? Absolutely not. It was in the first month of the war. And then there were no thoughts. There was only work, the destruction of the enemy and our survival. Next, a sister whose answer to her brother's battlefield death was to follow him into war. This is a Scripps News special, No Surrender. This half hour, we have taken you inside the daring missions that are keeping more of Ukraine from falling into Putin's hands. But behind every one of these battles are people who put aside lives and dreams to join the fight. People like a young musician we met near the front line. Major Ulana Suzanska meets us near the checkpoint on the road leading to the front lines. We traveled with her to report on an artillery unit in her brigade. <laughs> Turned out she was new at this. How long have you been a press officer? One week. One week? Yeah. But Suzanska's mission, her story that unfolded while on the road together, seems suddenly as emblematic of this war as the story we set out to report. Until just a few days ago, Suzanska served far from the front lines as the conductor for the Air Force Band based in Venezia in central Ukraine. Her unit played at military award ceremonies and parades. But then, in February, came the phone call every Ukrainian family dreads. Her only brother, Captain Oleksandr Sozansky, had died in battle. How old was your brother? Uh, 31. 31. When was he killed? The 70 of February. So really just a couple months ago? Yeah, two months ago. What happened to him? It was mortar shelling, she says. It happened on the bloody, contested battlefield of Bakhmut. My brother was the commander of a unit that carried out combat missions at Zero Line, Suzanska says. The Zero Line. 
what the Ukrainian military calls the near face-to-face -face trench warfare of this battle. He was a warrior. He's called Ragnar, the person from Scandinavia. And, uh, Viking? Yeah, Viking. Ragnar had shared with his family this video of his unit helping lead the charge in last fall's counteroffensive that forced the Russians to retreat from a vast swath of territory, including the one we're in now. For his valor, the army awarded Sosansky the Cross of Bravery. Before he died, in an interview with an army journalist, he offered this message for families of fallen soldiers. Of course, it's difficult to lose a husband, father, son, but these families should be proud of their heroes, he said. How are you doing? I don't know, actually. I don't know. Alec, There's no time to be sad. We have to fight. We have no other way out. We have nowhere to run, she says. And fight she would, joining her fallen brother's brigade near the front lines. Not with the power of a gun, but the power of information, of world attention. The most important aspect of the war is the information war, Sazanska says. Those who own the information own the world. The world must see and know our nation is invincible, she says. Fathers, sons, wives and daughters are fighting here, and we will stand until the last. Suzanska putting her passion on hold for now. Music is my profession, it's my life, but it's like the... It'll have to wait until after our win, she says. Until then, she honors her brother. My brother's motto was, a warrior lives as long as people remember him, Suzanska says. We must remember all our fallen heroes and fight on. As we speak, across Ukraine, fighters are gearing up for the promised counteroffensive and late word of new support as the British government announces it has delivered long-range missiles to Ukraine. Those storm shadow missiles have a range of more than 150 miles, so Ukraine will be better able to hit targets deep behind the front line, but Ukraine's promised not to launch them into Russia. So for now, the fight rages on. The death toll builds as long as Vladimir Putin decides to keep up this deadly war. Reporting from Kyiv, Ukraine, I'm Jason Bellini. The news continues now on Scripps News.